Hey, my name's Julian Carr, and welcome to the Spider headquarters here in Boulder, Colorado. Um, we're really excited for the upcoming winter, and obviously this winter is a little unique, and uh, we think a lot of people will be in the backcountry this year, which is great. Um, and so this was kind of just a, intended to be a group discussion um, to kind of go over some etiquette, um, some insight, and maybe just some protocols that uh, we can just make sure we're you know, relaying a message um, of being, um, you know, kind of thinking safety first and um, for all the increased traffic this year, we just want to make sure that that's something that we're promoting from the spider platform. And I think that each of us uh, will have something to say that you maybe you can have a walk away with. Um, and the intended audience is definitely not a, you know, true beginner. Um, if you are, that's awesome. Make sure that you get um, the proper gear and that you have um, a great, you know, baseline education. Um, and obviously we'll be diving into quite a bit. So I think, um, again, if you are a beginner, just make sure you get gear and education. Um, but obviously we're happy to have you involved in this conversation. Um, so to kick off um, the entire discussion, uh, we're gonna have Owen Leeper and he's gonna be talking about gear and we'll dive into kind of um, some specifics on what he likes to do there. Um, we'll have Lorraine Huber um, and yeah, say what's up to Owen there. And then we'll have Lorraine Huber and she'll be talking more about the prep. Um, and she's obviously, you know, lives in the Alps. Uh, and that's where she's based out of. So we'll be able to get even further insight from her. Um, then we'll have Connery London and he'll be talking more about, um, kind of out in the field, how to interpret the terrain while you're out there. Um, and then we'll jump in with Amy Ingerbretson and she'll be able to touch in about group dynamics. Um, and obviously I think we'll all have some personal experiences to share and she'll have one that uh, will be awesome to hear about. Um, and then we have Bobby Brown and he'll be talking more about kind of like the logistics of being out in the field um, when it regards to filming and building jumps and that kind of stuff. So um, we're excited to have everyone here and we're gonna kick it off right now with Owen and have a little chat about gear. What's up, Owen? Where are you right now? Hey, Julian. How's it going? I'm um, in my hometown, Jackson, Wyoming. I'm uh, getting ready for the season. To, well, it's already kicked off, but just getting over foot surgery and kind of get back into skiing. So um, it's kind of a great opportunity to uh, talk to everyone about backcountry and kind of getting your gear ready because that's uh, basically what I've been doing the last like week and a half. Awesome, man. Um, I heard it's been snowing in Jackson, so it sounds like you'll be getting into full swing of things pretty soon. Is that right? Yeah, I got my first powder day like two days ago. Went up sled skiing and it was about knee deep in the backcountry. So awesome. I'm still thin underneath, but yeah, it's getting good. Good, man. Well, I know uh, obviously you can dive into whatever you'd like to talk about, but you know, I think we do want to talk about gear and that's kind of the first thing you need um, when you're heading out to the backcountry. Obviously it's a big topic to cover, but um, what can you lend uh, by what you like to use and what gear you think is uh, super important, maybe some insight to not just the mandatory gear, but other little insight you can give. Yeah, of course. I mean, there's always the, the mandatory gear, the Beacon Shell Pro, and Abbey Course, and all of that before you even go out there. But um, I've learned a few things over the years. Uh, for one, I like the Beacon. A lot of people, they buy one 10 years ago, have the same one in the pocket. Uh, one thing I do is the range test. Um, I had an old Beacon. It worked fine up to about five feet. And it would disappear. So if you're out skiing with one of those and you get buried, they're never going to find you. So do with a buddy, test it out, make sure it goes. This is range, um, I believe, is up to like 50 meters. So if you're getting uh, much less than that, I would uh, be in the market for a new beacon. Awesome. Yeah, beacon, definitely important. What beacon are you running and do you like it? Um, yeah, so back to mine. It's uh, the BCA tracker. Yeah. Um, 
three antenna beacon. Um, a lot of the new ones are the same, but I love this one. Super simple to use. Uh, you pop it out, it has a digital readout, so basically can't do it wrong. It, it kind of walks you right through it. It takes practice to do it quickly, um, but it's very easy. They just came out with the T4, the Tracker 4. Um, so I think I'm going to be getting that one as well. Um, but yeah, it's been great for me for the last couple of years. Sweet. A um, couple more gear things, uh, just with the basics. Uh, shovel. Um, I've seen people out there with uh, plastic shovels. Uh, don't be that guy. Um, a lot of times you'll go dig through rock and debris and the plastic will get cold and just break off. So if you're skiing with someone, they have a plastic shovel, trade them for the day because they're going to be digging you out if something happens and tell them to upgrade. I think probe, pretty basic, just make sure you have one. Um, I go carbon fiber, uh, shave a couple extra ounces off so it doesn't hurt as much when I uh, launch off those huge cliffs. Uh, very similar. And then uh, one of my favorite things to use, I mean, we've used these a lot in the backcountry. Um, I don't know if you can see them oh, the wrong way. Yeah. But the BCA radios. Um, I have a lot of friends that go out, they just say, hey, We'll just yell, stay close. But in reality, that almost never happens. As soon as you ski down, you can't hear them, the wind picks up. Um, so this is one of my favorite tools. Um, I mean, you and I have used them to scope out big cliffs, let each other know whether the landing's soft or not, give it the go ahead or to go around. So I'd grab one of these if you plan on being out there very much, uh, especially for snowmobiling. Yeah, I agree. I think having extra radios comes in super helpful even if you're in a group that um, other people maybe haven't used them if you bring an extra one um, it always comes in handy um, so that's awesome advice how often are you um, practicing beacon drills and um, obviously being in jackson i would assume there's quite a bit of resources to you know, practice those kind of drills, but what's your experience with that and how would you suggest people get involved with that? Uh, DCA actually does a great um, kind of program and a lot of the resorts they put out training centers. So there's actually one at Jackson Hole and there's also one on Teton Pass. So you can go out there, take your beacon, take your friend, um, choose a day that's maybe not like uh, the best skiing so no one's in too much of a hurry and you can get in the field testing because one thing to see it happen on the screen or to do it in your living room, uh, but when you're out in the cold and actually dealing with trying to find something buried, it's um, necessary to be out there and try it. Yeah, I agree. And to anyone listening, um, if you have any questions, uh, definitely relay them our way and we'll be happy to answer them as we go or wait until you um, will have a specific question for one of the athletes. Um, so you mentioned that you're getting over foot surgery. How's that going? Are you pretty close to 100%? Um, well, I'm heading to the doctor tomorrow, so I'm hoping they give me the clear go ahead to start kind of skiing more aggressive and maybe jumping off some things, but not 100%. Yeah. Yet. For sure. Um, well, hopefully that does get to 100% soon, and I can't wait to get back out there with you. <laughs> and yeah. it's, it's still great for me. I remember that one time we were skiing back in, uh, what's the name of that canyon, the back of Jackson? Uh, we were doing granite laps. And I remember we were having a ton of fun. And even one time I was skiing down and you came to a stop and I almost like kind of got above you. And so it's like so easy to forget some of like these things that are so automatic that we all know of, which is like, don't ski above people. And even though you and I have skied so much, I remember I was like, holy crap, that was so easy that I almost just pulled in like right above him in this, in this area. So, um, and that's, you know, such a good experience I've had with you in the backcountry is great, but it was even like, wow, I even got tripped up myself, you know? Yeah, I think that's a lot of things that even pros do. It's like, you get so excited to go ski the powder, it's a big, big day, you're ready to jump off something and you just, oh. Uh, best thing you can do is just practice it as much. For sure. Uh, looks like we have a question from Kelly Gehring, and he was asking if you have any pre-season rituals um, in the way that you test your gear just to make sure everything is 100% ready to be out there. Uh, yeah, so I talked about uh, the beacon test. 
um, just making sure that you are getting the range that you think. Um, another test that I, I learned kind of the hard way is the, uh, so I ski with an airbag. Um, it's very important to test it every uh, So when they first came out, I don't even know how long ago that was, probably 10 years now, uh, I was heading up to Alaska and you can't fly with a full canister. So put the pack on, pull the cord, nothing happened. I had been skiing with a full canister all winter and no clue um, when it seized up or, or how long it had been going on. Um, so now every season I check that at once, make sure it works, and then go get a refill. So. That's great, man. Um, another one from Farrell Struber. And he said, as someone new to the backcountry, he's kind of on a budget. Um, what items are kind of like the must have items for backcountry gear? Um, I mean, you, you definitely need the, the beacon shovel probe in if you're going to be touring. Um, but you can also check out a lot of the used gear stores, pick up used skis, touring bindings. One thing with boots is they're very painful if you're uh, trying to mold your foot to a boot that someone else had been in. So I would recommend uh, trying to get a new boot. Um, yeah. But other than that, you go use gear on almost all of it. It's going to work out. Um, until you figure out if you like it and then figure out what you want to upgrade to. Yeah, Farrell, I would definitely say I'd echo what Owen said and add in, um, you know, definitely take a class um, on backcountry etiquette and how to use that gear and actually practice and with the drills and so that you feel comfortable um, until you feel absolutely confident and you have that baseline education, keep practicing or keep taking a course until you don't feel like there's any questions. If there's any question, keep asking questions and keep seeking out resources to make sure that you know you don't feel like there's any part of the process um, that we'll kind of get into with the rest of the guys. Yeah, and one of the best things to do is just go out with people that have more. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool, Owen, I think uh, we're good, man. Thanks a ton for the chat. We're gonna start talking to Lorraine, but I hope that you guys get a storm this weekend in Jackson. I hope that foot starts to feel better, but thanks for your insight, man. Yeah. Forward to skiing with you guys. So um, I'll uh, see you soon. All right, man. Cool. We'll bring in Lorraine now. Hi, Lorraine. Hi, Julian. How you good doing? To here. I'm good. Good. So you're heading to Europe tomorrow and today you're in California. That's quite the mix. I know, especially in COVID times when we're not used to traveling anymore. I <laughs> know. You're lucky. I don't even know what it feels like to be at an airport anymore. It feels yeah. Like it does feel like a long time that we've been dealing with this. Yeah. Well, it's an honor to have you uh, to be on this chat. Um, I think that you bring an enormous amount of, you know, insight since you've been able to travel in really big mountains um, for your whole career. And obviously... Uh, we're happy to chat with you about what kind of insights and um, I guess we want to focus on um, kind of the prep of it all. And uh -huh. so I know that you have a, a few things prepared that you wanted to to inform us about and we can kind of chat from there. Yeah, well, thanks for the intro. I appreciate it. It's a never ending process learning to be safe in the backcountry as safe as possible and to make the right decisions. But uh, I want to start with uh, a ritual that I would recommend anyone who wants to ski in the backcountry to install, and that's really checking the avalanche bulletin. So whether I'm guiding a group or whether I'm just heading out to go ski touring or free riding in my home ski area, I always start my day with checking the avalanche bulletin. And here in the States, you want to check avalanche.org, and then you can go to your local avalanche forecasting center in Canada, it's avalanche.ca. And in Europe, every state of Austria, for example, has their own avalanche forecasting service. So my home ski area, the Alberg, actually straddles the border of two states. So I will check the avalanche bulletin of Tyrol, the state of Tyrol and of Vorarlberg. And so what, what information do you find here? So first of all, it will give you the avalanche danger scale, which is a scale of one to five, so from low to extreme avalanche danger. And it will tell you what the predominant avalanche problem is or what the characteristics of that problem is. So for example, what elevation, what aspect, 
and the likelihood that you will encounter this avalanche problem. Um, so that's really important information. What's really cool on the avalanche.org site is that you get recent observations as well. So you actually get photos and sometimes videos of forecasters who are actually digging snow pits and have snow pit data, which I find really helpful to, to like, oh, I've got to fly there, to help me understand um, what the primary avalanche problem is. So just to give like listeners an idea, like a primary avalanche problem can be a persistent weak layer or it could be storm slab. So once I have that information, I want to be looking at the weather forecast as well, which is like, you know, a really obvious and important part of my preparation. So that will include, um, you know, what can I expect for the day? Will the avalanche hazard increase or is it expected to decrease? Is there a storm in the forecast? What kind of gear do I need to bring? So I can plan all those kind of questions. And, um, and based on that, I will make an observation plan. So basically, I'm going to make a plan of what am I going to be looking for when I'm out in the backcountry? What is it that I don't know? What do I want to know? So, for example, I'm constantly scanning terrain while I'm traveling in backcountry for fresh avalanches. Like, that's a really obvious one that I'm always looking for. And so with this observation plan, you're going to... Um, look for avalanche evidence and then take that information and compare it with what you were what you expected to find based on the avalanche report right so observation is like super important and if you have multiple eyes on terrain if you like hopefully you're not traveling in in the terrain by yourself it increases safety sure. um that so i really like to have an observation plan i was gonna say just add in that that's super important, I think, because even if you, you know, see a report that lends to something that is comfortable and maybe leaning towards safe, mm -hmm. and then you get out there and your observations, you know, aren't that. So even if you are heading out into the backcountry and you're anticipating safe conditions, mm -hmm. obviously those reports are done by, you know, professionals uh, that it's somewhat, um, you know, trustworthy. But I've definitely been out there before when we've encountered conditions that weren't what they're supposed to be, um, when we're usually looking for it to be worse than what they said it was. But sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, that's exactly what I think you also need to think about. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Julian, because you have to remember that the Avalanche Bulletin, it's just like general information about the Avalanche situation, the general Avalanche situation, but there'll always be local variations, always. And so that's why you have to be like scanning terrain and, and like checking what you expected with what you actually find in the field. And like ultimately you have to decide like on each slope individually make an assessment and decide if it's, if it's safe for you to drop in or not. So that's maybe something that's worth mentioning. And also the avalanche bulletins, they they really are designed for people who have at least like a, some kind of a avalanche awareness class or like ideally avalanche level one education. But I mean, there's so much info on it and it gives you some background info of how to read the bulletin. It's like awesome. There's lots you can learn for sure. Totally. And I would imagine that if you had maybe a trip um, that was a month out and maybe, mm -hmm. you know, it's the full swing of winter, and you're looking at all these reports of that particular area has a really persistent weak slab um, mm -hmm. that's maybe not a good idea. So I'm sure that you've even um, steered entire trips away from, you know, what has ended up being booking plane tickets and, you know, it, it's, it's happening, but then you're like, cause I know we've done that where you're like, yeah. man, we, we have this whole plan to go to the zone in a month, but it's not looking good. So I think that's another thing, no matter how much money you've spent or how attached you've gotten to going to a particular area, you can't be afraid to read those red flags and try to make a pivot in, in a plan B. Yeah. I really like what you mentioned about for areas that you're not familiar with, to also be following the avalanche bulletin on a daily basis, there weeks or even like you say, a month in advance, 
Um, so you want to have a ritual of checking your local avalanche bulletin like every day, even if you're not skiing, but just to really get a good idea of how the snowpack is developing throughout the course of the season. Plus, if you're planning a trip, it's such a such. Yeah, it's, it's just a really uh, good practice to to install. And then in terms of preparation, like, you know, I was ch chatting about gear, but you want to like consider what kind of gear to bring in terms of having a med kit and a repair kit. And also something that needs to be prepared is thinking about who you're actually going into the backcountry with. And I believe Amy's going to chat to us a bit more about like the human factor in, in terms of making decisions in the backcountry. But just generally speaking, in terms of preparation, you want to think about, you know, do we have the same skill set? Do my partners um, have the same like goals and fitness as I do? And uh, do we have kind of like a same risk acceptance level because if you're you know in the backcountry is someone who wants to just like say huck huge cliffs but you're just wanting to cruise some nice powder lines you're probably not going to have a very good day so it's something that you need to think about in your preparation as well right. you can cruise nice powder lines and jump cliffs all at once <laughs> yeah well maybe in some areas you're right yeah well i'm glad you brought up um you know a med kit i think that mm -hmm. You know, if you're going out in a group, you should establish, uh, you know, at least one, if not everyone having one is the best idea. Yeah. Um, but, um, and like you said, having a good feel for everyone's ability levels, fitness levels and goals. I think that was a great thing to add in. Um, and I think uh, unless you had anything else to add, we might jump over to Connery. Um, but thanks so much for the chat. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Julian. For Have sure. a great safe, weekend. Safe travels tomorrow. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Connery. Howdy. What's up, buddy? Just hanging. Hanging in Tahoe? Hanging in, hanging in Tahoe. Nice, man. Yeah. Get some miles in, getting the legs strong. A lot of mileage, a lot of hard pack, um, which is great for early season because you can ski hard pack well, then you can ski powder well. <laughs> One of the listeners, Taylor Hills, right out of the gate said, how come you're not naked, dude? <laughs> dude. That's a good question. <laughs> well, it goes without no. saying, your, your powder cover, naked, skiing, <laughs> ripping, has to be number one powder cover of all time. So, Well, I appreciate that. That's, there's a lot of good covers. Um, I'm just so lucky that I was able to sneak one in before they shut down, hopefully not forever. Um, yeah. But yeah, that was, a, that was a funny story. That was safe avalanche conditions for everyone to know because... Um, I wouldn't have been skiing without a backpack and, and powder like that if uh, it wasn't green light. So, sure, I'd imagine you've been skiing in that area for you know what a few days and just knew the snowpack really well, and you were in a very safe zone, right? Totally, very low angle trees, and yeah, uh, yeah it, was, it was all good to go. <laughs> so, Amy, she just said that she got to see the the naked cover shot live. Lucky girl. She was there. She invited me on the trip. That, that cover would have happened without Amy. So thank you, Amy. Um, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And uh, she held my jacket. It was kind. And Todd was there too. So, you know. Dig it. Well, cool, man. I know that uh, <laughs> you already mentioned that you're on a low angle slope and that there wasn't a worry about uh, avalanche for that cover shot. And that's great. And obviously you have a whole, you know, um, career and, and life of being in the high alpine and you learn kind of just the fluency of how to interpret terrain to feel confident about, um, you know, the idea of being in the back country, taking off your backpack to get that cover shot, but you knew you were in a safe zone. So if you can lend us uh, just kind of your protocols and thoughts of when you're actually out in the field and how do you interpret the terrain um, and how are you looking for those green lights and red flags and how do you travel around the mountains as a, by yourself in a group, obviously in the back country is kind of what we're leaning towards. Totally. I mean, you can relate. And as Lorraine touched on so much of it starts with looking at the Abbey report uh, first thing in the morning. So if things are extreme or high, like probably not going out in the back country, you know? Um, and if things are green light and they're low Abbey, um, still going to take precautions, but um, you know, you'll, you'll feel safer, not to say that you should take the AVI report as, uh, as the Bible for what you should do no matter what. You should always um, feel it out yourself. But I think more of the, uh, like the moderate to considerable 
range of of avalanche rating is where um, picking ski terrain is can be tricky or the, is the most tricky. Um, for instance, uh, the other day I was skiing in Tahoe and uh, we had a considerable report um, with facet layers and uh, you know we could have skied an open bowl and then there was a ridge with some trees and an opening there and then there was a ton of trees on the side of the ridge. So right away I was like, well, I'm, I'm trying to take zero risk avalanches ever really you know that's what we that's what we all want is this zero risk factor no doubt you know and so we did our first run skiing really slow through these trees just to feel out the snow um before we then stepped onto more open terrain that uh maybe could have slid it was but we felt pretty good about what we saw in the trees with how the snow was reacting nothing was really sliding no crazy noises and then we stepped onto the bigger slope and you know it was it was a good to go and we'd all tested and felt good about it and talked about it so um there's ways to to do it safely um and so yeah, slowly in the mountains what, what, you guys, what do you think well i think from your um experience that you just shared uh, it sounds pretty routine. And I think that once you do get to that decision that you are going to proceed, um, what's, how do you go about doing that? Like do you guys chat about who's going to go first, where they're skiing to, to pull over until the next person can go, will it be a verbal cue, will it be a radio. Like how is that orchestrated now that you're going to go as a group? How right. do you actually go as a group? Yeah. Good question. Um, so I think with, with that, I mean, before before even going, I'm inspecting all terrain, thinking it could slide at any time. Even if it looks 99.99% unlikely, I'm, my thought process will be that could slide. If it does, what am I going to do? If I'm making a left-footed turn, what's my exit strategy? You know, If I'm making a right-footed turn, what's my exit strategy? You're kind of always reading analyzing terrain and there's always a backup plan you know yeah you know i'd just, say that along with what's the uh visual of the group that they have on me so right obviously, as i'm skiing like obviously i want to know what my exit is at any given moment just like you said yeah. and also what is the eyesight on me like and that's kind of part of that plan that leads to are we comfortable skiing this or not? Because I know right. if you're going into a place that um, if you're in a group and there's no visual, usually it's not a good idea, even if, you know, it's looking like this is a green light, we can do it. If you're going to ski one at a time and there's no visual, it's probably, you know, you shouldn't do it. But it sounds like you guys were in the trees. There's good visual lanes um, and that everyone had eyes on each other, right? Yeah, this was a this was a very PG example, very safe. But yeah, there are more extreme scenarios where you're gonna want to have eyes on somebody, in which case you want to definitely have a spot where each of the skiers can stop and safely be to have eyes on you. So there's just so many factors that go into picking avalanche terrain. But along with that, I would say is looking at just anticipating that anything could slide, even if you think or know it's not. Sure. And having that backup plan in your head is a big part of my thought process. Sure. Um, just because you never know, you know, yeah. you, you, well, you know until you don't. Yeah. I know like living in Salt Lake and obviously there's a huge uh, backcountry, uh, you know, avid backcountry crowd in the Wasatch. And when I first started getting into it in college, I remember just going into, to start out at least, I kind of eased into it. Um, there's like a pretty classic, uh, for the most part, kind of blue square vibes area called Cardiff. And uh -huh. that's on the hike kind of over to Mount Superior. And obviously there's some super tricky areas that can be highly dangerous on Cardiff, but it's also plenty of low angle that can be pretty safe. So it was nice to go up with people I trusted, people that had experience and it was obvious to talk through that terrain and to see other tracks. 
So I think if anyone's going into the backcountry, obviously, uh, maybe choose places that, you know, you'll be able to see other tracks as visual cues. And obviously that's the classic, don't follow a track if you see it. But if you're starting to get fluency, like you said, of being able to learn, you know, where the stable snowpack is, um, you'll know which tracks look good and it'll help you to get an understanding of how those terrain traps look, how those red flags look so that you're not just out in the middle of the backcountry where literally no one's there. So I think it would be try to find places that, you know, are to some degree already well traveled so that you can have other people to meet, to chat with, regardless of how big your group size is. Totally. Yeah, man. Well, I know Tahoe has a huge backcountry scene and I know that you're out there um, for the most part torn, but you also sled quite a bit too, right? I do a lot of sledding too. Yeah, I'm sure that adds in a whole nother layer when you're truly removed from um, all of it, right? It does. And snow machines are very, very heavy and they can trigger avalanches pretty easily. Yeah. So you've got to be on your A game when you're snowmobiling and skiing. Yeah. Well, crazy. It's already been like 12 minutes we've been chatting. This flies by. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Otherwise, I think we're going to jump over to Amy. I just want everyone to have an awesome and safe winter. Nice, man. Well, yeah. I think if anyone swings through um, Tahoe, make sure you look up Connery and he'll show you around. Please do. Squaw Valley, baby. I'll be here. Nice, man. Enjoy yeah. the spring, the uh, early season laps, dude. Thanks. Good chatting. All right, man. Later. Amy, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Julian? Doing great. It's good to chat with you. Yeah, good to be on here. Um, yes, I, I did see Connery's Naked Cover live, and thankfully all I saw uh, was cheeks, just butt, so nothing cheeks, to you. Cheeks. X-rated, thankfully. I was, I was careful to like place myself. In so much cheeks. That was really nice to gift that trip to him that led to the cover. That's awesome. Uh, I mean, I'm happy for Connery, kind of. Should have been oh. yours, though, right? <laughs> There's been a lot of days where I've been out with people where they've gotten covers, and I haven't never, never had the chance to get my powder cover, but I have like Here seven others, so I'm fine. There's no naked Amy shots that didn't quite make the cover? No, I, I won't ski naked until they amend the rules of NAR. I think that women should get extra points for skiing naked because two reasons. We have more to expose and people would actually be psyched to see us naked versus... Valid. Completely valid. Hopefully the gap <laughs> if you're watching. Please note. <laughs> well, oh, uh, obviously, thanks for being a part of the chat. And I know you and I have had lots of fun times out in the mountains in Utah and Europe and some other places. So it's obviously always fun to chat with you. And I love being in the mountains with you, and I think you're a great decision maker. And I think that um, obviously when you're out in the mountains, it's a group thing. And uh, it sounds like you know you want to you want to focus a little bit on group dynamics and how that kind of plays into the whole backcountry equation. Yeah. Well, I mean, the way I like to think about it sometimes is like the backcountry itself isn't inherently dangerous. What's dangerous is humans in the backcountry. What's dangerous is me and you and all the skiers, snowboarders, recreators in the backcountry. That's what makes it dangerous, right? And so with that, you have to put as much focus and importance on decision making and group dynamics as you do on all the fundamentals we've talked about, your gear, uh, knowing before you go, reading your forecasts and managing terrain are all important. Um, and, and equally as important is how you operate as a human out there and being aware that humans are naturally perfect. And we are predisposed to, we, we make mistakes, you know, like it's, it's all humans make mistakes. It's in our DNA. And so knowing that you have to be on guard and, and beyond the fact that humans make mistakes, the reason we're all out skiing in the backcountry is to have fun and have a good time. And a lot of times when you, you're having a good time, you're on a high, maybe you ski a few runs with a good, you know, no results, you have to realize that your brain isn't functioning in a very defensive way at that point. And so the way like the experts talk about it is, is human human factors or heuristic traps. And there's like an acronym FASTS. And so what that encompasses is things like familiarity. Maybe it's somewhere you ski all the time. So you, you, you don't give it 
like the credence that it needs or whatever that slope or something, or um, maybe it's super close to the resort or something barely out of bounds. Um, there's acceptance where you're just trying to go with the flow of your group. Um, commitment would be like when you're like super tied to your goal, like I have to ski this today and you're not going to look at the warning signs and realize when to say no. And, and it's super hard to say no in the backcountry. It's super hard to say no in life. Um, and then, uh, what else? There's commitments, familiarity. There's the expert halo. So like going out with someone that's better than you and only deferring to their judgment because, oh, they've taken a level two. Um, like I, even when I go out with guides, I'm still making my own decisions. I'm, I'm using their expertise to then make my own decisions. Um, and then there's things like tracks and scarcity. Like, you know, sometimes if you see you guys talking about following tracks, but sometimes you can see a track, a slope with, hundreds of tracks on it rip right out. You know, that's not, you have to always be making your own decisions at like every single step and be on the lookout for the ways that your mind is going to tr trick you into not making bad decisions, but what I call like not making decisions. And I had um, a, an accident, actually like my third time ever in the backcountry. So it was almost seven years ago now, six years ago, whatever, a long time ago. But I was like brand new to the backcountry. I was like two weeks out from my first level one class, you know, and I was skiing a slope for um, a photo shoot just outside the bounds of Alta Ski Resort, basically like in the parking lot, a tiny piece of terrain, like no big deal. I was with Adam Clark and these locals that were like expert, you know, backcountry skiers and photographers. And I was just it was the end of the day, it was early season, it was a sick powder day, it was sunny, I was having so much fun. It was like my dream day. And, you know, we were on a slope like, oh, everybody gets their powder covers here, you know, da 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 da. And what ends up happening is I, it was a small slope over a very aggressive terrain trap, which is like anytime you have a place where snow can consolidate and not run out smooth, you're gonna have exponentially higher um, risk of burial and deeper burial depth if you were to get buried. And the slope ripped. I uh, pulled my airbag, but because of the terrain trap, I was still buried um, three feet under the snow. And what makes this story even worse is that my partners did not have backcountry gear. Nobody in my group had any gear. Um, I had a beacon shovel probe and thankfully strangers were walking up on the other side of the valley, saw it happen and rescued me complete strangers to this day. Like I never really met these men outside of that experience. And I got really, really, really lucky that day. And, you know, that experience has basically changed my entire life and my entire life as a skier in the entire way I've approached skiing in the back country. Right. Cause that, that was really affecting. And when I, I've spent so much time looking at what happened um, and I have gone through a lot of trauma counseling and, all of that stuff. But when I look at what happened is it wasn't, we made all the classic mistakes, right? Like really dumb, basic mistakes that you never would believe would be possible. Like, oh, I'll never be as dumb as that person. And that's not really what happened. What happened is we didn't make any decisions. More than making bad decisions, we just completely neglected the decision-making process. Nobody at any point was saying like, should we do this? Is this a good deal? We weren't evaluating anything. We were just going. And that's where, cause like the feeling afterwards was like, wow, how was I so stupid, you know? And your mind, you know, we're running with endorphins when we're skiing, we're doing what we love and your mind can run away with you. And I think that like, that's the thing that is going to trick us as much as any snowpack or terrain is like our brains and, and, then you add group dynamics to that and how a group makes decisions. And like, for example, Julian, you and I have been out in the backcountry where we have disagreed on whether or not it was safe to do what we were going to do. And we simply split apart and went separate ways, you know, like that's something that like we, even you and I have had to deal with group dynamics in the backcountry. And that comes back to people's experience and comfort levels and, and all those things. And so it's, um, I feel like I just totally rambled for like a million minutes there. <laughs> no, thank you for sharing that. That's really intense. Um, and obviously it's led you to have, you know, a pretty intimate relationship with making decisions and understanding the group dynamic is super important. Like you said, it's as important as the gear itself. 
and where you're going and reading the reports. Um, and I totally agree. And I think that you mentioned like, if you're out with someone that maybe has a ton of knowledge, um, that's great. And I feel like if you still have questions um, or you want to dig a pit or there's just anything that you're you know, curious about, about how this person that's a part of your group might just be making decisions, ask him, you know, ask him like why he is, what his assessments are basically. And, and if you're that person, I feel like you should never feel um, like it's a bad idea to explain your criteria, to dig a pit. Um, so if there is someone that has questions, you know, I feel like I've been in um, groups throughout my years that uh, whoever that kind of position of authority or the most knowledge can kind of act annoyed or take so many things for uh, just, they just assume that everyone knows things. And it's like, dude, talk to us. Like we don't live here. You live here, you know, like every little angle of this slope, which way it's facing, you know, history on this mountain. Like, let's hear it, you know, like let's share it. And so if you find yourself being that person, which I'm sure you have, and we've been that together, it's like, just communicate, put it all out there. So I think that again, the group dynamic is just communicate, be humble if you are that knowledgeable person, share. And if you're not, definitely ask, because if that would have been, I'm sure, a part of that group dynamic with your um, experience, that horrible experience, I'm sure that maybe it could have been avoided. Um, but yeah, I think that it's, it's really intense to, to, to be that person sometimes and to be in that position because like humans, it's just weird sometimes we can't talk to each other. Well, yeah, and I think in, in a lot of ways, I'm really lucky that I've had the experience to see how fast things can change because then you you see that and that, that'll forever be in my brain. But But I think when you know, when you're talking about group dynamics like that and an expert halo type thing, I think that a lot of times like communication and decision making in the backcountry, it's almost like a life lesson where it can be really intimidating to speak up, especially if you are the least experienced or like in my case, a lot of times I'm the only woman in a group of men, which can be a really weird position sometimes. And I think like in life, when you are going to go against the grain, it's, it's really Hard, but you have to, if you're going to be a backcountry skier, you need to get right with yourself and you need to find confidence to make your own decisions and, and also good decisions for those, for those, those in your party, because you have to understand that if someone in your party is going to make a bad decision, it's on you to fix their mistakes. And I absolutely believe that people performing rescues undergo as much trauma as the person under the snow. Like that is a bad situation and, and you have to have respect within your group. And this goes to what Lorraine and Connery were talking about is just like choosing really wisely who you go in the backcountry with. And I definitely don't go in the backcountry with certain people because we don't have similar decision making styles. Maybe we, we can't communicate effectively, maybe, or I just know that their tolerable like level of risk is not the same as mine. And it's just, it's, it is, it's like, you need to have confidence in yourself the whole time. It's like, it's, it's, yeah, it's important for backcountry skiing, but this is things that like we need to learn in our lives. And if, if you're not confident in your own decision-making skills and your ability to commu communicate to them, those things to others and be confident in yourself, like you shouldn't be in the backcountry. Like confidence should be one of your tools taking in the backcountry. Confidence comes from knowledge, doing your prep work, having your gear, get, getting educated. Like I, always refresh. I read this book. Uh, I was reading it during, <laughs> I was reading about uh, human factors while you guys are going, staying alive in avalanche train from Bruce Tremper. I read it every year, you know, and, and I think um, like thinking about the decision-making process, think about like as a human being that confidence to make your own decisions at every single step and watch out for how your brain is going to trick you into messing up because humans make mistakes. That's what we do, you know? Yeah, definitely. And I think a big part of that is making sure like your ego isn't involved. Um, you're kind of thinking as a group, not just for yourself. Um, but like you said, you're constantly, even if a guide is suggesting things, you're definitely taking that for consideration, not like this is the decision because maybe you haven't made your decision yet. So I think that's really important for people to understand that it's a group thing. And if you're not comfortable, keep asking and uh, keep the ego out of it. Um, looks like there's someone that had a question 
Um, what do you do now to make sure you are evaluating decisions instead of not making decisions? Is there any strategies to stop and evaluate? Totally. I mean, for me, I think it's about when I'm in the backcountry, I'm talking, talking, talking. I am chattering. I'm asking questions. I'm alerting people to what I'm seeing, whether it's good or bad. And so for me, it's about upping the communication level and having that confidence to just basically speak my mind throughout the entire time in the backcountry and pausing. And a lot of that to me, I think it comes from enacting protocols, which are really helpful to me where uh, through practice and training and all these things, you there's basically some protocols you can essentially follow in the backcountry for every step. You're always going to do these things. And for me, sticking to those protocols like, OK, new zone, we don't, you know, considerable day. We don't know what's going on in the snow. Definitely digging a pit. That's just protocol. Like it does, if I don't have time to dig a pit in that situation, I don't have time to ski it. And, and finding those protocol points where I can stop myself and say, this is a decision point. This is a you know line item on the protocol. Stop, you know. And like for me, it's easy because I've seen it can disappear so fast and there's no e anything that's worth that ever. You know, and like maybe as a skier, ultimately I'm missing out on some ski experiences because I say no more easily. But like I'm like I said, kind of lucky that like I have that because I, I think that it's, it is now a gift to be able to have the confidence to make the hard decisions when they are to say no. But granted, I still say yes a lot and have a lot of awesome days in the backcountry. You know, like it's it's not all doom and gloom, you know, totally. but you well, have to check yourself. Before we let you go, um, Ben Falkson, he wants to know what spider jacket has the best MSC rating, and that's maximum Snickers capacity. Well, obviously the solitaire kit. Um, yes. And Ben Falkson should know that the secret to the Snickers in the backcountry is that you actually put it in your long johns to keep it warm because nobody likes cold Snickers. That is great advice. <laughs> We'll leave it at that. Amy, thanks so much for all you shared. We really appreciate it. Thank you guys for tuning in and listening, and I uh, hope everybody has a, a good and safe and fun winter. Heck yeah, I hope to ski with you soon, Amy. Yeah. See ya. All right. Bobby Brown. How you doing, boss? Can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. Can you hear us? Hold on. Sorry yeah, about that, Julian. That's all right. I'll just keep talking until you can hear me. Because we can hear you, okay? Can Is you the audio us? coming through? Yeah. We can hear you. Why can't I hear it? I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about the technical glitch. Give me one moment. It's all good. I guess people can hear me. And just so you know, people can hear you. But anyway, Bobby Brown, what's the name of the project you just came out with? Everyone should go check out Bobby's uh, new video he just put out, Tilted Perspectives. It is incredible. Can you hear us yet, Bobby? <laughs> there we go. All right. All right. Can you hear us now? Can you hear us now, Bobby? I'm good. I'm, re I'm ready now. Sorry about nice. that. How you doing, man? Oh, doing well. Yeah, good. doing okay. Dealing with some techn technical difficulties. All good, my man. That uh, Tilted Perspectives looks amazing. Um, congrats on getting that out today. Or yesterday. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that was a fun one for sure. Um, finished that one up like in late February, so right before everything kind of you know, came to a halt. So it just felt good to kind of, you know, make something happen with everything up in the air towards the spring. So I appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, obviously that lends right into kind of what I think we're going to focus on. And that's kind of the whole dynamic of um, filming, shooting, video, photographers, and obviously traveling as a group and as a production unit. So obviously there's many locations, there's a more spread out, you know, part of the mountain you guys are all covering. You guys are all not quite all clustered in as a group. Um, it's a different kind of uh, dynamic of group decision making and obviously interpreting the terrain on like where you're going to build a jump, where is everyone located, how is this safe and all that kind of stuff. 
Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's pretty interesting because when you kind of think about it, you know, as you're building a jump, it's like, hey, it's going to be like a flat takeoff to a landing, and you know, you're not doing, you're not skiing much vert. So I think people get tricked into kind of thinking that it's incredibly safe, um, but that's not the case. You know, it's it's there's so many different factors that you have to weigh in. You know, we've had a lot of landing slide and like Amy said, into terrain traps and. And, uh, you know, that's obviously a huge problem. So um, I think that's just 101, you know, like us transitioned park skiers into the back country. Sometimes you think like, oh, like we're just going to go hit jumps or hit this cliff. And, you know, you might not look at the full picture and really assess kind of the zone that you're in. Um, I definitely think that's, you know, something that I've seen and been a part of in the past it's really freaked me out. You know, just it's just a whole different, you know, mindset and you got to leave your ego, you know, at the trailhead and, um, yeah, really just pay attention and be completely aware. So, um, yeah, it's, sorry, my cat's going nuts, but, uh, yeah. So that's kind of, um, you know, a little intro into like jump building necessarily. Um, so yeah. I think that even before you get to where you're going to build a jump, obviously you have to get there. So, I'm sure that when you guys are in the parking lot, you have to know where you're going so you're not getting lost and that you know if you're going to be crossing any avalanche terrain and when to like stop and slow down, regroup, or just to make sure everyone's aware of like what route you're taking just to even get out into the field. Yeah, I mean, like Owen said, those BCA radios are like paramount in sledding and getting to those deeper zones kind of uh, a lot of the stuff we ride, you know, is like 10 miles out um, on sled. So really, really important to have the communication and, you know, trying to keep that line of sight with everyone as you move and you navigate your way out to the zone. So, you know, when we show up to a zone that we're pretty familiar with, we have kind of checkpoints that you'll meet up, make sure everyone's okay, keep eyes on and slowly, steadily work your way to the zone. But um, yeah, when you get into new zone, on a snowmobile, it's definitely like a pretty interesting process. It's something where you're adding a you know huge variable to a situation, um, not knowing specifically the train, not knowing what's on the backside of certain things. So, making sure all vantage points are covered, and you know your team obviously is really tuned in with everything that's going on. And like Amy said, just sharing every little tidbit of thing you things you pick up throughout the whole, you know day getting up to that each point you know that's something that kind of gets lost i feel like sometimes you're all psyched and you're like we're gonna shoot it's bluebird like let's go i think just seriously like being patient being mindful and staying truly present is like one of the most important things in life obviously but when you're in the back country that awareness is uh is mount for sure yeah i'd say that um it's probably interesting too when you're talking to the cameraman or the photographer and to get the right angle they might be heading off to you know an adjacent slope that also has to be a whole another set of decision making um just to get that guy in location yeah totally i mean it's yeah i mean because you know you could be on north facing slope and then shooting from a south facing slope and so it's just like across the valley you know with a long lens so that's something that, you know, needs to have that discussion before any move has, you know, is made. Um, and that's something that, you know, when you have a bigger crew out in the back country, it starts to get super complicated. And so we've definitely strayed away from, you know, bigger crews and trying just to find that core group of guys that, you know, you can rely on and everyone has been out in the field together and you've really gone through all the checks and balances to get to that point. So, um, yeah, I mean, the cameramen are just as important as human beings as the skier. So it's like their well-being and what they're doing is is equally important to keep eyes on and to keep total awareness for those guys as well. So, um, yeah, again, it stems with the communication. And, you know, when you're setting up the shot and you're doing speed checks and test runs on all that, all these features, there just needs to be such a streamlined communication to make sure that everyone is fully tapped into the situation. For sure. Um, when you guys are out there, if you're not in phone service, uh, are you guys carrying like GPS phone or some kind of uh, way that you can still communicate with the outside world if there was an accident? 
Yep. Yeah. So we have a, we have pretty serious med kit with us and then we bring a sat phone on every day out. So uh, we actually were in Cook City, Montana, <clears throat> um, not too far from town, but definitely far enough that it was kind of an issue and there's no cell service out there. And we're with Jossie Wells and hit a jump and shattered his whole shoulder and so we're out in the zone and we uh ended up calling bruce wells jossie's dad on the sat phone and he was in new zealand he explained to us how to get the shoulder back into place and then from there made a plan to um evacuate jossie from the zone but that was just one of those instances that's like you know it was just it was just a shoulder but um obviously having that opportunity to call like if it was a very serious situation you could have called search and rescue to come pick him up and get him out but um yeah definitely having that tool just gives you the peace of mind that you know if you're super out there in the zone that you can make something happen and get the person out for sure well uh obviously with the upcoming season um do you have any cool zones you're going to be traveling to that maybe you haven't and obviously um, what's kind of the first step for you uh, when you think about safety in a new area you might be traveling to? Yeah, so we just moved to Telluride. Um, nice. So that, yeah, so we're really excited to be down here. And I've just, the, the resort around here and not done too much time in the backcountry. A, a couple trips down towards Silverton with MSP back in the day. But um, yeah, so I think the the number one thing we're going to do is find the, a good group of guys to really just start getting some uh, knowledge from. And that's kind of just the stepping stone into it is kind of just talking about it, looking at maps, looking at, you know, um, just information and just soaking that all up and then making a plan to start tiptoeing around and seeing what, what we get up to. It's great, man. I always call Telluride like the Alps of uh, the USA. So that's awesome. Yeah. There. The mountains are beautiful down there. Yeah, they really are. Well, dude, thanks a ton for obviously jumping in and chatting. Um, I think we're going to bring everyone on real quick so we can kind of sign off. Nice. Everyone's looking good. <laughs> um, oh yeah. Somebody asked about what kind of prep I did for like big cliffs. And I think Owen and all of us can say that, it's just a, uh, it's like a stepping stone of um, a comfort level. I was comfortable with five foot cliffs and until I tried 10 and I got comfortable with that. And it's just weird. It's grown to the point now that we can go assess and probe a landing, look at the sheerness of a cliff, look at a takeoff. And, you know, that comfort range has just gotten pretty big. And that's the point is just start small until you're comfortable and then you can start to progress. So I think that's kind of maybe one of the things that we're all relaying here on this panel is, uh, you know, progress your backcountry comfort levels slowly. Um, and, and you will find some footing and you will find some more fluency. And if, if you're, if you're struggling or if you're interested and it's intimidating, it's okay. You'll find a lot of people that did drop their ego and will be happy to collab with you. And I'm sure uh, Bobby's going to bump into people and tell your ride, that are locals and will lend a ton of knowledge to them. Um, so, you know, none of us are going out there as a one man show, um, thinks we know everything. We're definitely out asking questions um, and, and slowly progressing um, our backcountry skills, just as you would um, being able to do any kind of certain trick or the size of your cliff or the height of your line. Um, so again, thanks everybody for being a part of the chat and listening in. And thanks uh, Lorraine, Amy, Connery, Owen and uh, Bobby. Thanks, Julia. Thanks for having me. Have a good winter, everybody. Stay safe. Oh.